every suburb lives a global neighborhood where potlucks of culture can be shared. We're bringing musicians from different walks of life to share and create together. Mohammed Champ Ali is a Canadian Libyan artist based in Surrey, British Columbia. Conan Karpinski is a South African Canadian artist and composer based in Langley, British Columbia. Man, what's Sam, how you doing, man? Yeah, bro, how you doing, man? Good. Man, you tall as hell. <laughs> You're just comfy. Yeah, you know how it is, man. Nice fur coat. Yeah, big and small, nice and cuddly. <laughs> Amazing. One of the coolest reasons that I wanted to like see you and hang out with you and do this today and start to be paired up with you is mm -hmm. so we're both from Africa, which yeah. is great, but completely different areas. Where, where are you from in Africa? I'm from South Africa. Oh, no way. Yeah. Born and raised? Born and raised, uh, yeah. I moved to Canada when I was 15, but I, yeah. I lived the first 15 years of my life in South Africa. That's crazy, because I was born here. Amazing. But. We're from Africa, North, well, Northwest Africa. So my mom and dad are from Libya. Okay. And my mom's family migrated to Niger. Okay. So she kind of grew up there. And I spent more time in Niger than I did in Libya. Okay. Uh, just because it's kind of complicated with how the government was. I'm sure you're familiar with the regime that was in Libya. And so my dad was actually kind of uh, a refugee. He was a refugee. He was almost exiled in okay. a sense where he had, he had escaped political refugee there. Wow. Um, so we, we came out, we grew up here. So we never really went to Libya, but we, we grew up with those roots. There's a political turmoil there. It's very unstable in most African countries. Yeah. But the people are so much warmer. They're so much more welcome. Yeah. I can walk into any house, Absolutely. sit down and have dinner when it's dinner time. Yeah. Everyone has like almost a universal dinner time where you walk in and yeah. you can eat with anybody. Yeah. You can't do that here. Yeah. Your, your neighbor's always looking at you kind of weird. No, your, I agree. You know, people in your community don't really know who you are. Right? They just see you as the South African dude. This, these South African roots, there's a lot more to you. Whereas for me, straight up, like, well, he's, his name is Muhammad, right? Awesome name, Muhammad Ali. Appreciate it, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's why I go by champ. Yeah, right? yeah, that's great. But so there's this, you know, this dark brother, and he's a Muslim. So how do we connect with him? So back home, I don't got to deal with that. It's actually a little bit different. Back home, it's like, yo, he's a white dude. Yeah. <laughs> when I go to Libya, I can't. Like, you can hear the, the accent. I have an accent to them, and I have an accent here. Yeah. It's, it's such a weird... I have the same thing. Yeah. I don't know how to maneuver that, you know? It's weird, definitely. They you kind of feel a bit out of place sometimes because you, you, you feel like you're, you're from Africa, you belong there, and you have a sense of belonging here, but then when you go there to both places, you start to feel like a bit of a foreigner because then people be like, oh, where, where are you from? Like, you're a little different than South Africans. And it's like, well, actually, I am South African. Yeah. And then over here, it's like, oh, where are you from? Australia, Britain. It's like, no, South Africa kind of thing. You there, know? There's a word for that in Libya. It's called double shafra. So really? shafra means SIM card. And, you know, back home, we have two SIM yeah, cards yeah, on yeah. our phones. Yeah, absolutely. So they call us dual SIM because oh, wow. we're okay, dual cool. citizens, right? That's awesome. And so, yeah, it's so weird. When I'm there, people ask me where you're from. Oh, I'm from Canada. Okay. And over here, people ask me where I'm from. Well, I'm from Libya. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, it's such a weird identity yeah. crisis almost. It's not, it's not a crisis, but an exchange of identity. In Absolutely. Way, trying, trying to maneuver that. Absolutely, yeah. What's it like in South Africa? Because I know it's very different. Yeah. yeah. So South Africa is great because it is a truly like a multicultural place, multicultural. Um, and we just have so many different people there. We got, you know, English, which is me. Afrikaans, uh, which is my grandmother, so I guess I got some Afrikaans in me. There's Zulu, there's Koza, and I actually brought the South African flag um, to show you. So this flag is our flag that came around after Nelson Mandela became president. Okay, yeah. And all the different colors, it's just representing just how diverse our culture is and all the different colors of people there are in Africa. Mm -hmm. And it's great, it was really, like I've always been so like stoked and happy about this flag because it's just, A, it's great to look at. And then B, as I got older, I understood like the meaning of it and it's just so good, it makes you so proud to be South African there. And so it's part of the school system that we have to learn the other languages. So like up till grade eight, until I moved here, I had to learn Zulu, I had to learn Afrikaans and English because um, those are the big three. So when you go to a store somewhere, like someone that finished high school in South Africa, like an African person, uh, Zulu could be talking with an Afrikaans person that comes from like a Dutch white background. And the thing is like people are able to kind of adapt and speak each other's languages because it's the respect for the other culture. And also because it, in a way, even though it didn't stem from your original culture, 
because you're South African, it now is part of your culture. Mm -hmm. And so speaking other people's languages is a huge thing over there. Um, and it's, it's such a cool thing there. So, so you speak Afrikaans, Zulu, and English? Yes, but only up to grade eight of those. So I can't speak absolutely fluently, but I, I learned all up so, to grade eight stuff. So how, how, would you, how would you say, how are you doing in Afrikaans? So in Afrikaans, it's Ankhanam Kedis, is like, nice to meet you. And then, and then in Zulu, it's Sawa Borna, is hello. Yeah, so I mean, like, everybody can just kif halak, man. Sorry? Everybody can just kif halak. Nice, that's great. If you great. want to get fancy, the Iraqis say shakumaku. Amazing, nice, yeah, that's man. cool. Yeah. That's my favorite one, shakumaku. Shakumaku, yeah. nice. People, people don't know about it, but you say shakumaku. To respond to that, you say makushe. What does that I, mean? So shakumaku means like, what's up, makushe means not much. Okay. I really adapted it and I say makushaku back because nice. I've been saying it wrong my whole life. Yeah. Man, that's crazy, man. Yeah. Where are you right now in your music journey? What do you do? Who is Conan? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm a producer now. I started off as a songwriter when I was younger. I uh, didn't have any of the music theory or any of the musical training or anything like that. And I'm only this year for the first time learning how to read music and doing a bit more of the music theory, which I'm finding super interesting. So kind you played everything just from learning? Yeah, I started on the drums yeah. um, and I, then I got a guitar after that and then piano. I never went for any lessons for any of those things. I just enjoyed it. And my, my parents just let me kind of just freely create and express and just make noises around the house. And they never told me to stop. So I guess that's why I just kept going, which was awesome. Um, but now I, it's, it's, I was fortunate to, to meet a couple of guys in high school and we started a band called Soul Push. And oh, we've been able to tour the world together, work with a bunch of people. And that has led me to producing for other artists, which has been amazing because we lived in London together for two years. And I was working a bar job there, but then I lost the bar job when I went to go visit family, come back home to Canada for Christmas. When I went back, they, I didn't have a bar job to go to. But we had the studio that we were rehearsing out of, so I thought to myself, why don't I just use the studio to start um, producing and recording other artists? So I made a little website, other artists came in there, and I just started collaborating with people, recording with, with them, recording on the gear that we were using and stuff like that. And that kind of led to, when coming moving back to Canada, starting up a studio here and producing for a lot more people, which also led to composing for other people as well. So now I do film composing too. Yeah, I'm working on a lot of like, band music at the moment, different artist projects where I'm producing for them, and then also some short film stuff and, and feature film, like uh, scoring and stuff like that. Yeah. But That's sick. So that need of like, I need to survive and fend for myself, kind of built, fed in with the wants of wanting to make music and you kind of brought the two together. And that be, that's when you became Conan. Absolutely. And yeah. And with, with necessity comes innovation. There you so go. So it's like, I, I love that. With necessity comes innovation. Yeah. That's, a, mind, that's a good quote from um, my, one of my longtime collaborators, Andrew. And it's just like, it's one of those things where you could go back to the bar job. Yeah. But, but why? Why don't you just why, like... Why go backwards? Never yeah. go backwards. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and since then, that was 2017. Since then, I've been making uh, just music for a living full time. And I've been really enjoying that. Yeah. That's crazy. And your family just on board the whole time? Yeah, they, yeah. well, they weren't. Um, my mom always supported. My dad did support it, but he wasn't like confident in it. And it was really really lovely because the first show that I had with my band he came to watch and since he saw that first show ever since then he was like do it like you know it could be made a career out of it so he, he, he saw that there's then. something there that's lucrative yeah yeah, yeah absolutely it, it can make it happen for you yeah can you see the life I'm living with all the gear that I've been given I'm bad bad news don't go saying I'm the villain So for me, I kind of got into music during the Libyan Revolution. Yeah. The first song I ever made was called Eyes That Bleed. I remember we were, I got a YouTube beat, recorded it at my friend's brother's place. He was a DJ at the time. He's like, yeah, come over to my place, I'll record it for you. I think the first time, I think I gave him like 40 bucks or something like that. Okay, great. And I was like, yeah, yeah that was my first experience at a studio. Um, and we kind of just went from there. And it was inspired by my cousin. Uh, he went by Ibn Thabit, and he was a huge artist in Libya during the revolution. Okay. I was like, man, this is a great way for people to know how you feel. I want to do this. And I kind of I started doing that. And I had, nice. I had no expectation. I remember we had like a little iMac that my uncle bought us. Yeah. It was in the, compu it was in the kitchen. Yeah. And I would like log into my YouTube and be like, oh, I got five views, 10 views, 20 views. And then someone picked it up and shared it on their page. And then two days later, I have like 40,000 views Amazing. on that song. And I was like, Amazing. Shit, that's great. Yeah. Here's the problem. I just wasn't good. 
<laughs> I w- no, no, trust me. I okay. wasn't good at the time. I was awful. You're probably just hard on yourself. No, no, no. Trust me. Okay. I'll play I this for you. you. I trust you. I, trust I was you. awful. What it was, though, I could write. Yeah. Because I came from a poetic world. Mm-hmm. Everything else had to develop. And it took a long time to develop. I had no musical background. I started listening to music when I was like 17, 18. Yeah. Really. So I did. I had to learn melodies and flow, but that sh- it, it, all, it, it all came naturally to me. Mm-hmm. And over the years, it was just a lot of me in my bedroom, YouTube beats. Yeah. You know, J. Cole type beat, Kanye type beat, Kenneth nice. type beat, Justin Bieber type beat, Ed Sheeran type beat. And I started doing everything. Yeah. And I remember I would record it on my cell phone. Nice. And I'd like, I'd just be like, Singing it to myself, and I go to my aunt, wake her up. She was the only one who would ever listen to my music at the time. Like, what do you think of this? She's like, no, no, back. really. And I would be, what do you think of this? She's like, okay, yeah, that, that one's better. Okay, interesting. And slowly for for years. So she was honest. That's great. Exactly. She yeah. was really honest with me. And then through through t- with time, as I got better, my brothers started telling me, oh, you're actually good at this, and they, they became my support system. Eventually, I built enough confidence to start start sharing my stuff. Hmm. Um, and yeah, that's kind of, my, my mom wasn't supportive for a long time, actually. I think she just started against, my brothers weren't really supportive in the very beginning. It wasn't that they weren't supportive of my craft. It was more so like, man, like, make sure this is not something that you want, you know, it's going to be your life because yeah. you got to make money, you got to do this. And eventually, my brothers were like, man, this guy's talented. You could do this. And my brothers were really my biggest push. Mm-hmm. And then my mom, she, my mom will never come out and say 100% like, yeah, go do this. But the fact that she lets me make my music, you know, yeah. have my guys over, listen to my music, and she's, I know how she supports me without her having to say she supports it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. And she'll listen to me. She'll, and she'll, she'll, she'll always listen to me sing. She won't interrupt me when I'm doing my thing. And she'll actually, like, break, give me those props sometimes, yeah. you know, in the way that she knows how to. Amazing. It's just a cultural thing. She's a little bit more strict, right, with, uh, with what she wants for her son to be, doctor, lawyer, engineer. Yeah. Right? But she eventually kind of got on board. Um, but yeah, man, that's kind of been my journey, and I'm lucky enough to have been surrounded with good people, um, my brothers, and even the ones that aren't my blood brothers are called mm-hmm. my brothers, because they really got, got me into the music and taught me how to be more versatile, and just having these people around you that uplift you in your sound, that's good. coming from a place where you had no musical background, yeah. it's so powerful, and you it need that. It shape you, yeah. It shapes you, and I, I think you had that with your, with your band. Right? Yeah, when absolutely. you say that you had yeah. a band, you had people that were there that were constantly supporting you, good or bad. It was constructive yeah. criticism, absolutely, or it was good feedback that it's would necessary. help you, that, that would support you. And I think that was a, if I didn't have that, I don't think I would be here. Fun, fun fact: my song, my name was actually Shahar Sahara before. Okay. So my name is Muhammad Ali. Yeah, great name. When I first started during the Libyan Revolution, I was like, well, I want, I want to fight for my people in the way I know how, which is through poetry. Shahar in Arabic means poet. A Sahara means desert. So I was poet of the desert. Just like the famous Omar Mukhtar used to go by Lion of the Desert. Okay. And with time, I had a rebrand kind of thing, start my music again, because I stopped for a while, while while I was in school. I would just be in my bedroom writing songs, right? Yeah. Getting better and better. As I decided it's time for me to release. I need, I need a name. I need something, because everyone needed a stage name, right? Yeah. So my cousin used to call me Champ, and my brothers called me Champ. And my teachers would call me Champ. Yeah. So Champ was the thing. So I went Champ Ali. Why, why do they call you Champ? My name is Muhammad Ali. Oh, of course. Yes, <laughs> yes. That's great. See what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. So that nickname just picked up. So I said, okay, Champ Ali it is. And I loved it, man. And so they gave you the nickname. You didn't yeah. give it yourself. No, it kind of just came up as awesome. growing up. It was Champ, right? Yeah. My cousin, his, his thing was always, the Champ is here anytime I would walk into a room. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And so That's with that, entry. it just, yeah. it was, and he, man, this guy, he inspires me so much. His name is Ibn Thabit. Um, I think, you know, he hasn't done music for a while. He's getting back into it now. But this guy was a huge inspiration to me. And, um, yeah, man, just a lot, a lot of, I bring different aspects of my life into everything I do. Yeah. And so all my music is based on what, true stories of myself or my okay. friends or my community. And I like, I like my music to empower the mm-hmm. people around me and the people that brought me up to where I am. Yeah. So, for example, we released a song called Blady a couple of years ago. And Blady was about how strong and how powerful the impact of women are especially muslim women are in our communities yeah. and that they are the backbone of our foundation mm-hmm. as men in our societies get a felly come on in the champ story Cold 
culture for the team Couldn't do it like the woman Africa, Middle East No denying, you switch it for sighting Thinking through your mind and your eyes are for a dime Revolution thoughts and you're moving like a lion No, it was honest, it was raw, I loved it How long have you been singing for? Since you so, started? Well, here's the thing, so I want to say my whole life and I'll tell you why Yeah So, in the Islamic faith, we have the holy book of the Quran Mm -hmm. And the Quran, we read it with Tajweed. So Tajweed is the way you enunciate. Okay. The beauty you put, the way you beautify the words, right? So, for example, I'll share with you a chapter, the first chapter of the Quran. It goes, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, right? The way you would read it is, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Okay. You see what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm Deen. So you beautify the Qur'an. Yeah, very right? melodical. Yeah. Exactly. And I actually memorized it when I was younger. And that's something I kept with. Amazing. So I feel like that helped me a lot with my music too. Because that's awesome. I was able to hit keys and hit tones because naturally my whole life I've been doing it. Yeah. To say singing professionally, I want to say over the past three years. I nice. really picked it up, tried to, you know, refine it and fine tune it. But I feel like it's always been there yeah. with, with my Qur'an and with the recitation of the Qur'an. And the way I write my lyrics... I like to make sure that they follow a certain code of, you know, what the Quran preaches. Of, you know, I don't like to talk about sex and drugs and things like that. Yeah. I, I like to make sure I'm talking about something empowering, something that's going to uplift our community, mm -hmm. something beautiful, something positive that's getting positive messages, yeah. right? And that's the same alignment in the Quran of all po like the positive mes messages Amazing, it shares, yeah. right? So do you find that there is a, sim there is a connection that comes with one from faith? So people of the same faith, as you, even though they have different cultural backgrounds, and then separately, people who are culturally similar but have different religious backgrounds. Mm -hmm. do you, is there ever like something that distinguishes the two, or do you just feel connected equally to both? That's an interesting question because I, I do have a hard time identifying myself as a Christian um, because I love a lot of the things that they teach, but I also don't agree with a lot of what they do teach. Mm -hmm. So um, I had this conversation with my mom years ago, and she said something really great to me um, that it's about whatever, it's about you and whatever you believe in. And like what, it doesn't matter what anyone else says kind of thing. So I do believe in like Jesus and I've had my own experiences of, of why I do, but there's a lot of culturally in the Christian culture that I don't necessarily click with and align with. So um, to kind of answer your question, it, it's less about um, just more people in general because I don't find myself going and hanging out with people of a certain faith or anything like that. So it's just about vibes, you know, it's like, I think predominantly all my friends are, are I think are atheist mm -hmm. you know because we, we never talk about religion and, and if we ever have they just they just don't know about what they believe in and stuff yeah. so it's it's definitely more of a individualistic like it's up to the person how we mesh and it's it's less about kind of trying to find a, a religious um, culture to kind of sync with if that, that kind of answers your question a bit 100% and I, I I just felt so empowered to come from this festival where it was all these Muslim creatives right for the first time, I was connected to people from my faith in a creative way. Mm -hmm. But what I came out of that was, how do I bring that same energy to people that are not from the same faith? Mm -hmm. How do I come up with that and bring it to people who are not from the same cultures? As me? Yeah. Because even within the faith, people have their different religious um, levels, I guess. Right? People have a different level of faith than someone else. You might be more devout than the next person, but yeah. someone else will be more devout than you. So we have our similarities, but we have the same key principle and we believe in God. Right? Yeah, yeah. I feel like that should be enough to connect us. It should be completely up to the individual because my first instinct isn't to go and ask someone about their religion in a situation. It's more to collaborate with people. And if we ever get onto the topic where it comes up like, and we want to have a deep conversation about it, that's awesome and I'm all game for it. Yeah. But m most of my friends, I don't actually think I know what their belief system is just because it's not a way that we've determined if we like someone or if we don't you know what i mean 100 it's just it's just everyone goes about it differently you know well it's never the topic of conversation that yeah. comes up hey where are you from are you muslim are you christian yeah is that, uh, it's gonna determine no it's not that it's more so being able to first of all be on a human level of i like you for who you are as a person yeah exactly but now teach me about you exactly teach yeah. me what makes you conan what makes you yeah as a person is you're south african so that's your culture. You yeah. believe in Jesus. So now I understand your faith. Yeah. And then we get into what kind of ice creams you like. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you're gluten-free, if you're dairy-free. Mint-free. Right? I mean, mint chocolate chip. That's Let me tell about. you. Mint chocolate chip is hands down the most underrated the ice cream in the world. The if best. you don't like mint chocolate chip, don't talk to me. Don't slide in my DMs. Hey.
Maybe slide in my DMs. <laughs> keep an open mind. What about open people mind. that like chocolate or just no, that's, that's, that's my only barrier, man. That's my cultural code. That's no, but mint chocolate chip is the best ice cream in the world. Back in the day, I used to just sit in my bedroom and I would sit with this uh, on my bed and this is all I had. And I would like do drum loops on here and then add chords and we kind of write songs along that way. Yeah. Um, this is when I wasn't doing it on the guitar or the piano or anything because this is when I started getting into music production. Mm -hmm. What actually happened with this song is I was working on another song of ours and for some reason I felt like super inspired. I was, I was looking for sounds to fit in another song and I came across these piano hits here. And I thought they were really cool, but I, I thought they didn't fit the song that I was currently working in. So I actually just started making a new beat out of it right away and wrote the whole song that evening with the production and everything like that. Um, and kind of just came across this and, and landed up doing this whole... And you can Yo, see it's kind of like a sample. It's so soulful though. Yeah. yeah, yeah can well, you play that one more time for me? <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, that's nice. so beautiful. We're gonna have to do a remix with you. We'll, we'll do something here, yeah. man. Yeah. yeah. So what happened next? Yeah. So I put that together. That land up turning into this with a little bit of, uh, you know, production. Because we we land up compressing a lot, added some saturation, and just yeah. got a bit sync more synced up. Then what I did next was I added some drums, so you can hear like, and then chop it up. And I did it on this thing. Um, and then I just started playing this beat that you hear, here. Well, I'll just solo it. And then together with the piano, it started something, sounding something like this. That is hot, man. Of course. Um, yeah, and then yeah, so then those hard. were kind of the backbones of the beat. And then th at the time, I was like, this is so different. This feels like hip hop and we're an indie band. Like, this doesn't make sense for me to do. But I was just enjoying it. So I just rolled with it anyways. Yeah. Um, and it ended up being like one of our most popular songs, which was a good thing at the end of the day. Um, but that's the beauty of it. When you bring that indie into the hip hop world, yeah. it change, it's something people don't hear. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. When you give so someone something fresh, yeah. that's what kicks off all the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, man, yo, that was hot. And it was, it was nice because it was like, it was hip hop. So it's like, this is not really my world. And you know, I, I don't really do that much hip hop or anything like that. Um, it's kind of like that rock indie kind of thing. Yeah. So then it's taking that, but then now blending it with like that rock and indie kind of world. So yeah. then that's when you kind of get that true blend because I'm not going to, you know, try and imitate hip hop artists because there's so many greater ones out there and it's not yeah. like really where I come from but blending the two genres together then you get something like this so I added this bass in here um, that was just this bass line that kept walking around oh keeping it with a two yeah I like that a lot yeah that's, oh that's beautiful and then adding bass course, is my favorite thing bass like, is great bass guitar especially oh yeah yeah you, you, without bass you got nothing no you just need to feel it you need you need bass yeah a little, uh, exactly the rasp of the song yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> added some guitars electric yeah electric guitar and here's the thing um a lot of producers and studios they kind of want like the best tones like it's obviously great if you go to a really nice studio and you plug into a really good amp and you, you do everything the right way but because everything was so di um like do it yourself sorry DIY, I actually went DI, which is like direct input. And yeah. I just, I didn't have an amp. I put my guitar straight into the um, interface and recorded right away with some of the stock plugins that I have on my computer. Mm -hmm. They kind of emulate amps. Because a lot of people get very, you know, tricky when it comes to they want to get the right tone. They want it like they're very meticulous You want to make about it so it. perfect. So perfect. And I really respect that. And I think that's awesome because they do it so well. But that's not how I work. I just kind of want to get all the ideas out. And then you just get used to the, the sounds that you just land up keeping it, you know? Yeah. So like there's a solo at the end here um, that is literally just plugged straight in and then uh, kind of just played around with it. It goes like this. And in context with the song. Yo, this is 
crazy, man. It's kind of blend the genres, Yo, this you know? is crazy, yeah. man. Yeah, and then, so what happened was I like to, in my creative process, take breaks because I always find that if I'm sitting at the computer too long, you kind of just get trapped in that headspace. So for this one, I wrote the beat, then I went and actually had a bath, and I was sitting there, and that's when I came up with the melody for the song. Finished the bath, came straight downstairs, did the like recording of the vocals, then showed the guys the next day, and they, they enjoyed the song. Can you show so, me the final product? Yeah, so let's listen yeah. to it. So this is how it turned out. Hot, man. Yo, that's so hot, man. Woo! Appreciate it. Yeah, and so we got so different skill sets. So let's put them together. I'm down. Yeah. You say you like taking breaks? Let's take some pizza. Let's get some pizza <laughs> and run into the studio. I love it. Let's make this happen. Yeah, this Sounds is good. Hot. Tune in to the next episode of The Neighborhood to see Champ and Conan work together to create an original song about brotherhood. You just don't know who I'm coming from. And I come with a beat, do come. I say I'm loving on this drum. Chill, nothing but my friend, Cole, the man himself. Oh, Cole, what you got, man? Champ's the man. Hey, Conan's the man. It's good for your health. <laughs> Conan on keys, a song that can sell. Cause that's good for my wealth. I don't sing too well. <laughs> you can play keys, I can sing notes. 